Wine and Crime contains graphic and explicit content which may not be suitable for some listeners. Listener discretion is advised. You are listening to Wine and Crime, the podcast where three friends chug wine, chat true crime, and unleash their worst Minnesotan accents. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> Remember how we used to have to be at jobs at like nine in the morning? Yeah. <laughs> it was awful. Today we're recording at 10 a.m. <laughs> we are. We're losing it. A collective mess. I <laughs> have not brushed my teeth. Nope, me either. <laughs> I'm in the clothes I wore to bed. I just snuck a bra on underneath because this is a video episode. I'm only wearing a bra because I'm wearing a, a white t-shirt. I'm yep, not wearing a same. bra. And I'm only wearing makeup because it's tattooed to my face. <laughs> <laughs> I have my bag of McDonald's ready to go as soon as we're finished. Hi. <laughs> and three beverages. Yeah. I'm very yep. thirsty in the morning. Yeah. But the reason we have to record this early is because today I am flying to Minnesota so we can do our live stream. Which will live be show. long since over by the time you hear oh, this. Oh, yeah. Because <laughs> we are very far ahead right Oh, now. yeah. Post plug. <laughs> Woo! That it was, was fun. awesome. Wasn't we, that fun? We had a uh, great time. <laughs> I'm having so much fun. <laughs> Whatever. That's marketing 101, folks. <laughs> Always retroactively market. <laughs> Always be retroactively marketing. Ah. Arba. Arba net. Oh, okay. Who are we? Oh, oh shit. fuck it. I'm Kenyon. Yeah, uh, Lucy. Uh, Amanda, whatever. I don't care. <laughs> so Too weird. early to have an identity. <laughs> <laughs> it's. 10.15. Let alone care right. about it. 11.15. <laughs> it's too early to have an identity. I came downstairs today at like 9.50 and Bill goes, oh, you're up early. <laughs> oh, no. That's my the, mail. That's my the dynamic person, in this house. My like mail deliverer mm -hmm. comes usually around like noon. <laughs> and I am deliverer. Always just in my pajamas with my cup of coffee in front of my like fully huge window door. <laughs> oh like... <laughs> my god! My <laughs> my my coach was recommending that I like build community in my neighborhood because like white people are pretty bad at that. A lot of the time, we're very individualistic. So she was like, "Get to know your mail carrier," and I was like, "Okay." <laughs> so. I know mine. I Roxanne. know you do. I <laughs> waited for him looking in the window. <laughs> wow. And then when he approached, I burst open the door. <laughs> Just to say hi? Just to say hello and introduce myself. He fully had headphones on, wanted yeah. nothing to do with no. me. Yeah. No. Yeah. Like, Community building. <laughs> Burst Check. out of your home and terrify your mail carrier. Across Check. the mail carrier. I know my Check. UPS guy, Zach, and Jesus. my mail carrier, Roxanne. Wow. Well, also, I haven't lived here that long, and I've only lived here during a pandemic where it's like, leave the goods at the door and <laughs> step back a hundred yards. And wear a mask so you can't <laughs> see most of my face. Yeah, <laughs> and I put on a plague mask to gather my packages from the front <laughs> stoop. So I'm Just giving myself them in the sleeves of your robes. <laughs> giving myself a fraction of grace. <laughs> That's it. Oh my god. Anyway, what are we talking about oh, yeah. today? Apropos yeah. of nothing. So we have a very special fan pick this week brought to you by Taylor Ammons. I would like to have some salted almonds. Mm. Oh. It's your jam. I yes. do love them. You do love salted almond, almonds. Almonds. Mm -hmm. Almonds and the chipmunks. And Taylor has selected the topic of <laughs> Louisiana crabs. Oh, Justice Butterfield crabs. <laughs> 
Wow. <laughs> My morning voice is very deep. It's a husky. <laughs> good morning. Good morning. No. So anyway, <laughs> we also, we got a critique, a fair and valid critique from a listener email. I put it in your folder, Amanda. You haven't seen it yet, probably. Okay. Right. Um, about how, like, doing Southern accents or Appalachian accents to denote someone being unintelligent is... Not incredibly cool. common yeah yeah which we definitely have done and do mm-hmm. but i just want to say that it is a separate thing justice butterfield is a fucking celebration yes it's a judge he's a yeah. judge <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> justice butterfield is not stupid no and also we just happen to sound really stupid. <laughs> That's our attempting fault. Attempting <laughs> a southern accent or other accents. Mhm. So that will happen a lot in this episode, not making fun of the accent, making Mm-mm. fun of ourselves for being so bad at it. Mm-hmm. I mean, the only accent I do more terribly than Justin Butterfield, who I love, <laughs> is my British accent. Yeah, exactly. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Too, yeah. Need I say more? <laughs> I so, think that people use the Minnesota mom accent too oh, yeah. to denote certain things. Absolutely. So that's what putting on an accent is, and it's yeah. always. I'd argue we sound the dumbest in our um, natural voice. natural <laughs> accents. <laughs> <laughs> We sound the dumbest when we're being our true selves. (laughs) (laughs) So I just wanted to flag that up. Totally. Okay, so what is our wine crime pairing for 10 in the morning? God. Louisiana crime. It's coffee, you guys. It's fucking coffee. I'm not drinking wine (laughs) at 10 in the fucking morning. I love this show. I love our listeners I so love much. Wine. I love wine, but I'm just not going to do that to myself for any of you. I'm not going to do it. That's for vacation only. Yeah. Yeah. I so, am not on vacation. <laughs> no. So I just want to take this opportunity to let everybody know that we do have new varietals available as um, the gals wines. And I really, we have, we've got a new rose and we're going to get a little more. Again, as we're recording this, it's early, but I believe they will be available by the time this is released. But we don't have, it's like just making its way to us now. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to give a detailed description, but on our website, there will be plenty of information about the new varietals. We're getting a new white and a new rose. We still have the Gals Red blend that is the same blend from previous Launch, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and the white wine specifically is extremely, extremely, extremely limited. We only have twenty cases of it. It's only going to be available as part of the three pack because this is such a unique small batch, like gorgeous she's wine. Special. Yeah, she's real special. So you're definitely going to want to jump on that because when when that one's gone, that one is a uh, gone and likely yeah. never coming back. So head to our website, wineandcrimepodcast.com, and go to that wine tab and check out the gal's wines, which are incredible. And we are loving this partnership with Blendique that we've been doing for the better part of the last the wines are six months. So good. They're mm-hmm. extraordinarily good. Yeah. So snatch them up. Go to our website, snatch them up. That's the plug. I'm not drinking wine today. I'm drinking coffee. Deal with it. I love you. Let's do this. I already had my coffee. I already had my morning BM. Now I'm drinking sparkling water. Oh. I'm drinking water, orange juice, and fountain coke from McDonald's. So you uh-huh. know it's gonna be a good day. <laughs> yep. It's gonna be a good poop coming down the pipeline. Oh, <laughs> let's get to that sponsor break. <laughs> <laughs> but first, <laughs> Lucy, what is our background and maybe psych for losing crimes? This oh. is psych. Okay. All I want to do so is Louisiana. go back to New Orleans and eat crawfish. I know. Yeah. I love New Orleans so much. I, I want to live there. Next what? sentence. I've only been to Louisiana once when we were in New Orleans for Crime Con a couple years ago, but it's a very cool and unique state. And also mm-hmm. New Orleans is amazing. Incredible. 
So mm-hmm. many rock shops. So many mm-hmm. wig shops. Remember uh, when we got stuck in that rainstorm and we took shelter yeah. in a wig shop and left with wigs? Hundreds, Hundreds of dollars, dollars yeah. of wigs. <laughs> a lot of wigs. <laughs> and that it was the best thing ever. And I love those day. wigs. And you got your daddy fan. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Ugh. Our New was Orleans trip day. was the greatest like week of my life. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it should the be Museum annual. of Death. Hi. Mm-hmm. So Louisiana is a state in the deep south mm-hmm. and south central regions of the United States. It is the nineteenth smallest by area. It's quite a small state. That's true. And the twenty fifth most populous of the fifty United States. Wow. Louisiana is bordered by the state of Texas to the west, Arkansas to the north, Mississippi to the east, and the beautiful Gulf of Mexico to the south. Jesus Christ, Ray. <laughs> Just launched himself onto my desk. It's well, really... is the pink pen there? Yeah. Yes. He always sounds surprised, but and he it does happens it every, every day. Time. <laughs> I know. I just love it. Jesus Christ. Rascal. <laughs> Ray. Ray. <laughs> A large part of its eastern boundary is demarcated by the Mississippi River. We'll get back to that. Ever heard of it? Yeah. Louisiana is the only U.S. state with political subdivisions termed parishes, which are equivalent to counties. Uh Didn't think about that. Uh The state's capital is Baton Rouge, and its largest city is New Orleans, Mm. which lies on roughly the same parallel as Cairo, New Delhi, and Shanghai. Cool. Interesting. Yeah. I want to know seems... what parallel I'm on. Wait, N- Cairo? Not... Cairo. New Delhi and Shanghai? Is that true? That's what uh, Encyclopedia Britannica says. I have to look at a map. That's crazy. Yeah. Well, most like maps that we're used to are are skewed in a some mess. way. Yeah. Right. Because yeah. the globe is round. Yeah, to flatten it's it and just white it's surprise. a big old mess. Mhm, mhm. Fun fact about Baton Rouge, it supposedly got its name which translates to red stick mm-hmm. in 1699. French explorer Pierre Le Moyne d'Iberville, <laughs> got it? Wrote that he saw a pole covered in animal blood along the Mississippi River bluff. Oh, a uh, Mississippi River bluff. And named the it red pole. town red stick <laughs> like baton red rouge stick. the yeah. pole served as a marker signifying the division of land between the bayou gula and humas indian tribes hmm. in 2018 louisiana was ranked as the least healthy state in the country with high levels of drug related deaths and excessive alcohol consumption and it has the highest homicide rate in the united states since at least the 1990s so Plenty of fodder for this episode, I would imagine. Yeah. And a lot of that is attributed to, like, voter suppression and racism. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We'll get to that. Yeah. Much of the state's lands were formed from sediment washed down the Mississippi River, leaving enormous deltas and vast areas of coastal marsh and swamp. It's a very Mm -hmm. wet state. Mm She wet. She's wet down there. She's damp. Oh, so humid. Mm -hmm. You'd (laughs) step outside, and as a glasses wearer... (laughs) <laughs> yeah not, not easy to to walk mm. around she fogs right up she fogs <laughs> that was Sorry, pre-mask days <laughs> oh yes. yeah that was pre-mask <gasps> oh i can't even imagine mm-hmm. so these contain a rich southern biota so like you know bi- biome biodome Okay. Typical examples include birds such as ibises and egrets. Mm-hmm. So large, creepy birds. There are predatory. Also, yeah, very dinosaur-like yep. birds. Velociraptors. Yeah. yeah. Big bugs. Slightly too. evolved. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Big beaks. Mm-hmm. Big beaks. Oh no. <laughs> there are also many species of tree frogs. And no. fish such as sturgeon and paddlefish. Cool. I've caught those in Animal Crossing. I was just going to say, I had ah! a dream that I caught an octopus in Animal Crossing, and then a little bubble popped up and it said, you, you've you beaten Animal Crossing. Like, you won. And, and I was then like, you what? sobbed yourself awake. And then I ran to Blathers, donated mm. the octopus, <laughs> and I turned it off never to be turned on again. <laughs> Remember when I taught you how to run? 
in the yeah, game. <laughs> I was playing for like two months before I realized I could run. Just walking. I was just walking around my island. It took me forever. <laughs> anyway. Kenyon has left the chat. Yeah. <laughs> I just got an Amazon package delivered. That's why Josie was barking, if you heard it. So I can Amazing. just run down and see what that was about. No, we can move on. We can move on. We'll move on. Also, alligators with an estimated 2 million wild gators and gators another. Are they, they are, are pissed. They are pissed. And another 300,000 on alligator farms. Do we need alligator farms then? If there are gator 2 bites. million. They eat a lot of alligators. Well, yeah. Couldn't we like source. to control the population, not be farming them? I don't know. Maybe the maybe 2, mi- two million wild gators is a perfect it's not number. Enough. It's not enough. We don't know. We're not <laughs> ecologists. You're right. You're right. <laughs> yeah. We're not ecologists. Well, I think farming them for that purpose is just more sustainable. That's fair. Mm. They're like pigs and cows. Yeah. Oof. It's meat. In more elevated areas, fire is a natural process in the landscape and has produced extensive areas of long leaf, pine forest, and wet savannas. Wow. These support an exceptionally large number of plant species, including many species of terrestrial orchids and carnivorous plants. Mm. So cool. There's like weird shit going down down it's there. Jurassic Park. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. There's Walking lots of in weird the garden shit. district, I was like, yeah. how does a leaf get that big? Yeah. One oh. leaf. How is yeah. moss hanging from trees? Right? Yeah. It's Sir, you're moss. Kind of mind blowing. <laughs> oh. Uh, Lots of petroleum and natural gas, even when Amanda isn't there. Yes, I wrote that joke into my notes. Sugarcane and cotton grows very well here, too. So lots of plantations and therefore Mm -hmm. lots of slavery. Mm -hmm. So on that note, the descendants of enslaved Africans make up nearly a third of Louisiana's population today. Racial conflict marked the development of the state from the American Civil War period and Reconstruction through the Civil Rights Movement of the 1950s and 60s, the guarantee of suffrage through the Voting Rights Act of 1965, and ever-increasing African-American political involvement, however, have helped move the state toward being a more racially egalitarian society. Mm-hmm. Still a long way Still to go. Still not perfect. Mm-mm. Long way to go. As with but the entire country. Yep. Yes, for sure. In addition to African cultural influence, particularly West African, the state has a complex multicultural and multilingual heritage influenced by a mixture of 18th century French, Haitian, Spanish, French Canadian, and Native American, in particular the tribes of, please forgive me for not pronouncing these correctly, Mm -hmm. Alabama, Cushata, Choctaw, Chimimaca, Huma, and Tunica Biloxi. There is no official language of Louisiana, which I thought was cool. Hmm. As of 2010, about 91.2% of the population spoke English. 3.5% spoke French, and that includes Cajun and Creole. Mm-hmm. 3.3% spoke Spanish, and 0.6% spoke Vietnamese. Cool. cool. So lots going on there. Yeah. And I think that is so cool. Also, the food. Oh, my God. Yeah. Seriously. Uh, Beyond yeah, we, just the gator bites. We the need shrimp. Shrimp. the shrimp. Best shrimp. Best like seafood. Ever. The gumbo. Yeah. There's mm-hmm. nothing like nothing beats like Creole style seafood. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, God. I need to go back. <laughs> you know. I need to go back. <laughs> no. So I learned that the major difference between Cajun and Creole in terms of food is that Cajun uses tomato-based sauces and Creole Mm. does not. Cool. For the most part. Okay. Okay, so this is from Encyclopedia Britannica as well. Admitted to the Union in 1812 as the 18th state, Louisiana commands a once strategically vital region where the waters of the great Mississippi and Missouri River system, draining the continental interior of North America, flow out into the warm, northward-curving crescent of the Gulf of Mexico. It is not surprising that seven flags have flown over its territory since 1682 when the explorer René Robert Cavalier, Sieur de la Salle, placed a wooden cross in the ground and claimed the territory in the name of France's Louis XIV. Mm. So the, it was first named La Louisiane, meaning related to Louis. Mm. 
Mm. The consequent variety, the consequent varieties of cultural heritage run like bright threads through many facets of the social, political, and artistic life of the state. Mm-hmm. I what didn't did realize it? that there was like also that period of like Spanish control. Yeah, we'll get like, to it. Oh, okay. Yeah, the Spanish had it. Well, <laughs> had it. As far as colonialism goes, right. I think yeah. the Spanish had it first. Occupied it. Mm-hmm. And then it went to the French, kind of back and forth, blah, 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 blah. We'll get to mm-hmm. it right now. <laughs> the Louisiana Purchase was kind of bonks. Mm-hmm. Like, I forget how enormous that territory yeah. Yeah. was. There are photos on the drive. Yeah. Once part of the French colonial empire, the Louisiana Territory stretched from present-day Mobile Bay to just north of the present day Canada United States border, mm-hmm. including yeah, us, like more than half of Minnesota. Yeah, it's it's like all half. Of it. It's half of the modern country. day United States. Yeah, right. And that includes a small part of what is now the Canadian provinces of Alberta and Saskatchewan. It was fucking enormous. So mm-hmm. if you go to the drive, this will be on the blog. There are pictures. Like there's a picture of the entirety of North America. Mm-hmm. And the Louisiana Purchase is just like, like, like a, a middle big old chunk. It's going to take this middle part. <laughs> it's yeah. this. Huge. It's huge. And when you consider. The fucking balls on white people. Seriously. Oh, right? <laughs> this is fine, right? They just close their eyes and start scribbling. <laughs> yeah, we'll take that. Oh, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. I'll just. Uh, we'll have those people just move out of the scooch, way and we'll just, just take scooch. that. You just either scooch. scooch or we'll murder you. Or die. Yeah. Scooch or die. Oh, ugh. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So This is gist, our legacy, white folks. The gist of the Louisiana Purchase is that Spain controlled the area of about 828,000 square miles beginning in 1762 in 17 so many square miles. It's, uh, it's just a lot of square game. miles. Yeah. In 1795, Spain and the United States signed the Pinckney Treaty that allowed the US to use the Mississippi River and New Orleans to transport their goods. So Spain was just like, well, it's still our territory. You can you can drive you can, through it. You can use the river to do whatever you're doing for our economy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because obviously the Mississippi and New Orleans were mm-hmm. integral to Everything. Uh, The the Mm -hmm. entire economy. Uh Uh-huh. Then Napoleon got jealous of that sweet, sweet sugar trade and acquired the territory from Spain in 1802. And there was some, like, drama there. Spain was supposed to keep this deal, like, a secret, but totally didn't. Like, someone at a pub spilled the beans. (laughs) Basically. Some guy. It's always some. Over tapas. It's always some guy. (laughs) Some drunk guy over tapas. Uh (laughs) Uh-huh. Narc. Like a year later, that shady bitch Napoleon changed his n- mind and was now open to negotiations. Like, mm, eh, mm, we can talk about it. So Thomas Jefferson sent Robert Livingston, U.S. minister to France, to negotiate the purchase of just New Orleans and then also some portions of the East Bank of the Mississippi and also the rights to freely navigate the river for U.S. That's commerce. That's amazing that he was like, we just want the good bit. Right. Yeah. I mean, they could see how incredibly <laughs> right. valuable. Yeah. But it was like, like he if was you trying had New to Orleans like, get like a discount. A thousand percent. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he just wanted the premium, the goods. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He wanted Hulu without the ads. Mm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So he had given like the uh, Thomas Jefferson had given Robert Livingston like 10 million bucks to kind of play with, see what he could do. And in April, 1803, France was like, how about you just take the whole thing for like 20 bucks? And the U.S. was like, well, that's technically violating our Constitution, but what the hell? So Can't they say signed, no to that deal. So they Minnesota signed the deal. love a discount. Yeah. <laughs> but actually, okay, so they signed the deal and doubled the size of the U.S. for $15 million, which is so cheap. nothing. Yeah. 20 bucks. Mm-hmm. So that boils down to less than three cents per acre. My God. It was a steal. Literally. Literally, <laughs> Literally a steal. Literally a stolen steal. land. Yeah. yeah. Scooch a triple or die. Steal. It's just it's the Spanish, sick. the French, and then the, the US. Oh my God. <sighs> it's yeah. so painful. 
The highest point in the state is only 535 feet above sea level, and parts of New Orleans are actually about seven feet below sea level. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> Sir. I, that I, makes me very nervous. uncomfortable. <laughs> My butt puckered. Yeah, I do not want to live under the ocean. <laughs> The southern Oof. coast of Louisiana in the U.S. is the is among the fastest disappearing areas in the world. Mm-hmm. This has largely resulted from human mismanagement of the coast. Shocker. Artificial levees block spring flood water that would bring fresh water and sediment to the marshes. Swamps have been extensively logged, leaving Ugh. canals and ditches that allow salt water to move inland. Mm-hmm. Canals dug for the oil and gas industry also allow storms to move seawater inland where it damages swamps and marshes. We ruin mm. everything. We ruin everything. Katrina, like, is our fault. Yeah. Oh, a thousand percent. Yeah. For, like, a number of reasons. <laughs> for every reason. Yeah. For <laughs> all of the reasons that I'm describing yeah. here. Yeah. Rising seawaters have exacerbated the problem, also caused by humans. Mm-hmm. Some researchers estimate that the state is losing a landmass equivalent to 30 football fields every day. What? How? How are people still living there? I don't know. In 2005, Hurricane Katrina eroded an additional 73 square miles of the Louisiana coastland. Ugh. There are many proposals to save coastal areas by reducing human damage, including restoring natural floods from the Mississippi. They could proposals. just do what Manhattan did and just pile up garbage and then build land like that. I think they do. Yeah. I know, I know. But Ugh. isn't that crazy to think about? I Manhattan mean- is like... Twice as wide as it used to be from just like human garbage. Mm-hmm. Isn't there like and they a built whole skyscrapers on? Mm-hmm. Isn't there like a whole island somewhere around there that is just a dump? Like there didn't probably. used to be an island there. Yeah, probably sounds right. I mean, we shouldn't say that about Staten Island, but. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, we just lost 10 listeners. <laughs> we know you're there. We love you. They don't have internet there yet. Oh, my God. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I have nothing against it. <laughs> it's just clearly that's fruit. not true. <laughs> I looked at an apartment there once. It was not a good situation. <laughs> Did it have internet? <laughs> uh, <laughs> it had the dark web, probably. Oh, nice. I just nice. think of Staten Island as the Wisconsin of the New York coastline. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> There's a ferry. That's cute. Pete Davidson is from there. That's true. We got, we've got. we gotten derailed. Back to Louisiana. <laughs> <laughs> Fun fact to offset all of what just happened. (laughs) The world records for both the most people twerking simultaneously, which was at 406, and the most volunteer hours worked, which is 77,019 by one Viola Cochran. Wait, so worked by one individual? Yep. They were set. They were both set in Louisiana, and these honors were in no way related. I love it. (laughs) <laughs> I love it I want to see 406 people twerking simultaneously I'm yeah. sure there is footage of that somewhere Yeah, amazing Okay, gotta talk about the flag Because it's uh, weird So the flag features a cute mother pelican And her three cute pelican children And speaking of pelicans The brown pelican is the state bird Okay. And then when you take a closer look You may notice fucking blood coming out of her chest is yeah. the flag on the drive? As a sign oh, of, yeah. Yes. Described as a sign of the state's willingness to sacrifice itself for its citizens. Wow. So the design goes back to medieval times when people believed that pelicans fed chicks with their blood. So this is yeah, supposed to show accurate. the pelican tearing at her own breast to feed her children her blood. The blood is actually Ooh. a remarkably big deal, at least to one narc eighth grader in 2010. And this is from Wikipedia. During the 19th century, it was traditional in Louisiana flags and the state seal for the pelican in her piety to have three drops of blood on her chest. 
In later years, the tradition on both the state flag and the seal have been haphazardly followed, maybe because it doesn't look that great. It's a little creepy. It's odd. The blood isn't lined up with the three pelican baby mouths either. Mm -hmm. So it's like one is getting all the blood. Mm -hmm. Not very fair. It's clearly the favorite child. Yeah, it's, it's the one that survives. That's the New Orleans of the state. Baby New Orleans. Baton Rouge is pissed. Mm, Baton Rouge is the one all the way to the yeah. right. Yeah. Squad. Baton Rouge. Red Stick has enough blood. <laughs> Red Stick. Okay. So basically, as time went on, some of the seals and the flags didn't have the blood, which was noticed by an eighth grader at Vanderbilt Catholic High School in Huma, Homa, which brought this to the attention of his state legislator. <laughs> In April 2006, the Louisiana state legislator passed a law which specifies three drops of blood to be depicted on the pelican in both the state's flag and the seal. Just an eighth grader demanding blood. (laughs) Yes. Literally, yes. I mean... We all know... Damien Faye. uh, We know that eighth grader. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Kyle Green. I know. (laughs) We all know. (laughs) Hi, Kyle. Hi, Kyle. Hi, Kyle. I think he does listen. I think so. <laughs> I'm really excited about your bachelor party. Oh, my God. Okay, so I'm going to close this out with some Cajun slang. Okay. The first one is a shout out to Amanda. Cher oh. means sweetheart or ter- it's like a term of endearment. Oh, like Cherie. Yep. So oh, most of these come from French. Yeah, that makes sense. The letter T, if you put a T before someone's name to imply little, as in petite. Mm-hmm. So T Kenyan, T Amanda, T Lucy. Okay. Really? It. Sussy means a little something extra. Ooh. Sussy. Minu means here, kitty. <gasps> Minu. Minu. Oh! Minu is cute? a very cute name for a kitten. That is a cute name for My a kitty. My little Minu. Uh, cuillon. Cuillon. Mm-hmm. Am I saying that right? Croissant. Cu- cuillon. Cui means balls. Like, ooh. Cui. Cui sack. Mm-hmm. Well, couillon means a rascal. Mm. Ball sack. Okay. Uh, if you say, come see. Come sa. Come here. Mm. So come see, even if there's nothing to see. Mm-hmm. Nothing to see here. Envy means hunger. So, for example, I've got an envy for some gator butts. That's uh. all. That comes from French, yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm. Bobbin. Bobbin. It's like a poop face. Like a poopy face. <laughs> She made a big bobbin when they when she found out they were out of gator bites. I mean, once this coffee hits, I'm gonna make a big bobbin. <laughs> I'm gonna be bobbin for apples. My my in laws say skank face instead mm. of stank, stank face. face. Skank face. <laughs> but they say I heard it, all. They say it so often that now Zach and I have started to say skank face. Mm-hmm. Don't make that skank face at me. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> skank face. <clears throat> okay, this was my favorite one. Go to bed means get out of here. <laughs> get dressed. Call a priest. Call a priest. Go to bed. <laughs> Can we please make call a priest merch? Yes. Yes. A thousand percent yes. From our high as fuck special thanks. Yeah. Call a priest. <laughs> call a priest bed. cell phone cases. <laughs> get dressed. Call a priest pop sockets. That would be good. Mm-hmm. Grand bead. Grand bead means a big clumsy man. I am married to a grand bead. (laughs) (laughs) You are. Yeah. Yeah. He can cook, though. He's incredible. He's not that clumsy, actually. He's not clumsy in the kitchen. Oh, the bedroom. Oh. (laughs) Well, I'll tell you that off the air. (laughs) What he did to me the other day. Oh, my God. It was not comfortable for one of us. Okay. Make the veya. Veya. Let's go make the veya. Means spend the evening talking with friends. Cool. So on Thursday night, we're going to make the veya. Yeah, we are. we are. Pommy means to laugh or cry so hard that you can't catch your breath. So what Kenyon does <laughs> on pretty much every episode. Yep. The wheezing is my favorite. <laughs> To slow down the TV or to speed up the TV means to turn up or down the volume. Love that. Nope. 
Speed up. Hate that. Speed up That's the TV. That's very confusing to me. I love that. <laughs> no. And another great one. Watch the slap means I'm I'm about to slap you. <laughs> Watch the slap. Watch it. <laughs> So a lot of these are kind of crossover with Creole slang, but a lot of the Creole comes from Haitian, and I just didn't feel comfortable with a lot of those pronunciations, so I went with the Cajun. Mm-hmm. So yeah, there's some there's some Cajun slang for you. Awesome. And that's Masag. This cool. Th- very, very awesome. Okay, ignorant question here. What is the difference between Cajun and Creole? Creole is the Haitian French... Co- Yes. So Creole is related more to the Haitian West African black culture. Mm-hmm. And Cajun is more descendants from French Canada. Mm. Okay. Okay. So, so they both have French influences, but different, yeah. different background. Yeah. Yep. Interesting. Yep. Oh, okay. Cool. Yeah. Good to In- know. Very interesting. But honestly, their, their culture, oh, it's so intertwined. Like, there are there are a lot of crossover both with the mm-hmm. food, the language, all right. that stuff. But they just kind of came from two different areas. But mm-hmm. I just think it's really, really fucking fascinating. Mm-hmm. I also watched a couple of YouTube clips of like people with Cajun accents, like Ooh. Bayou, like Deep. Oh Love. my god! Some Very are cool. really difficult to understand, even though they are speaking e- English. Yeah, the accent is just fucking. It's gnarly. wild. I love it. It's amazing. Mm-hmm. We'll probably do Cajun crimes at some point. Yeah. yeah. I can see that happening. So we can just, let, if we do Cajun crimes, can we just share recipes for two hours? Yes. I mean, and I then, will have nothing to add, but I'll go, mm, that Google sounds good. Them. I'll add that to my list. And then there's no list. Never do it. Yeah. I just want, never make I it. I just want gator bites. Mm, me too. I have a fun fact about bourbon and Bourbon Street. Ooh. So, Louisville and New Orleans are, you know, very, they're like kind of sister cities. There's a lot in common. They both have the fleur de lis as Mm -hmm. their symbol and like French history and whatever. And bourbon comes, is is called bourbon because it comes from Bourbon County in Mm -hmm. Kentucky. And so the bourbon barrels would get, they just had the word bourbon or bourbon county on them, on the barrels, as they were being shipped down to New Orleans, to the ports. And so when they arrived in New Orleans, all these barrels of booze said bourbon on them. And so that's what they started calling it instead of whiskey. Mm. And that's what Bourbon Street comes from. Mm. Is not bur- is bourbon just, it's a type of whiskey, but like. It's a type of whiskey and there are different rules for it, but it has to be from Kentucky. Got it. I think. Ah. Like champagne. Yeah. I think. Well. Yeah. There we go. Let's just go with it. The bourbon barrels thing and bourbon street is true. I like that. Yeah. See, the Mississippi River Mm -hmm. doesn't go through Kentucky, does it? No, it's the Ohio. But it got down there somehow. The interior of North America. (laughs) Love it. All okay. right. Should we hear a quick word from our sponsor? Yes. Yes. So I love having my nails look amazing, mm-hmm. as this is something that people just know about me. And I'm really, really good at doing my left hand because I'm right hand dominant. And then I go to do my right hand, and it looks like a baby threw up on my nails. <laughs> It's not a good situation. It is the worst. But I got the Olive and June Manny system. And now I can do do DIY Mannies that look salon perfect, whether it's your dominant or non-dominant hand, and that lasts seven or more days without chipping. Yeah. It's the most amazing thing ever. Tell us more. It's like magic. It's sorcery. It really is. So the Olive and June Manny system is life-changing. I was on the Olive and June train even before they became a sponsor of our show Mm -hmm. and I have turned on several of my friends, including Kenyon, again, before we got the system, before we got the sponsorship, onto Olive and June because it changes the game. Mm -hmm. It's so easy. Uh, My favorite part about the system is that it comes with what they call a poppy. It's like a little rubber handle 
that you just pop onto the like the brush top of your mm-hmm. nail polish and it mm-hmm. it's weighted so it balances that your hand. So if you're painting with your non-dominant hand, mm-hmm. like Amanda said, really easy for it to come I didn't out believe looking in it. like baby barf, but I didn't believe in it. And yeah. then I tried the poppy, and my God, I will never doubt anything Lucy tells me ever again. Well, that's very generous of you. <laughs> <laughs> and also a lie, but the poppy really works. <laughs> Some things I can be trusted on. Um, their petty system also has all these amazing tools. I like to really dig all that dirt and stuff mm-hmm. out from under my nails. Oh, uh, the ingrowns, get it. Oh, they come with like such good tools it really Mm -hmm. is like going to the salon at your home you have all all that same stuff the manny Mm -hmm. system with six polishes breaks down to about two dollars a manicure so Mm -hmm. when you think about going to a salon you're spending like minimum 35 bucks on a gel manicure Mm -hmm. their colors are so freaking cute i'm currently obsessed with lava wearing it right now (gasps) it's so good it's so good it's it's your self-care moment you know you want to clear mm-hmm. off your coffee table, just get all your nail polishes out, turn on some Real Housewives, and give yourself an amazing salon quality manicure and yes, pedicure. Yes, yes, it's yes. incredible. Get on this train. It's the best. And now you can get 20% off your first Manny system with our code GALS. So listen, your new nail life is here, okay? Get that 20% off your first Manny system when you use promo code GALS at oliveandjune.com because we are done. We're done with expensive and bad manis. This is the new us now. oliveandjune.com. Use that promo code GALS and treat your manis. Treat them. Are you engaged and not sure how to make your wedding happen? Maybe. I mean, probably. You might be. I don't know. <laughs> but you can join a million couples who have planned their weddings with Zola. Zola makes wedding planning easier and less stressful by creating everything that couples need all in one place. You got your wedding vendors, you got your save the dates and invitations, you got your free websites, you got a registry, and so much more. Planning a wedding is mind-blowing. I don't know how I did it, to be Mm -hmm. honest with you. And I unfortunately got married before I knew about Zola. If I had Mm -hmm. a do-over, which it's only a matter of time... (laughs) <laughs> she screams toward her husband. <laughs> I'm definitely using Zola. So <laughs> Zola helps you to find wedding vendors in your area. So the venue, the photographer, all that coordination is so helpful to have a little bit of backup, like the kind that Zola gives you. Mm-hmm. Zola will start a conversation with any vendor for you so you don't have to like do that cold calling. I hate that. I love that. Well, I love that Zola will do it. Oh, I yeah. hate doing the cold hate, calling. hate yeah. cold calling. They also mm-hmm. have the cutest most beautiful designs that are affordable like you can just browse they've got an entire library they've got like different paper types foil Mm -hmm. hi so cute they offer free shipping free matching envelopes free guest addressing hello hi oh my god i am so glad that i hired somebody to do the addressing because i i i i can't I'm anticipating like a 600 person wedding. So obviously I'm going to be using the guest addressing from Zola. <laughs> and Zola mm-hmm. won't stick you with that no return address. No, <laughs> they would never know me. No, you are not to be nulled. <laughs> Zola offers free wedding websites. So you can have like an FAQs page. Like, are kids invited? Hell no. no. <laughs> On- but cats are. Oh, yes. Online RSVPs. Uh, guests can shop your registry right from your site. So even coordinating that registry, it's amazing. There, yeah. the Zola registry really, I think, is the best part. So you can it fill is. it. You can fill it with gifts, cool experiences, cash funds, all in one place. Mm. Zola offers twenty four seven access to support that you won't find anywhere else. Human people, actual yeah. human advisors, who uh-huh. really understand what it's like to plan a wedding. They won't gaslight you. They won't make you feel like an insane person because. Planning a wedding is really difficult, and Zola is really there to help you with whatever your needs are. It's incredible. It's honestly everything you need in one place, and it's amazing. So go to Zola.com slash gals today and use promo code SAVE50, that's S-A-V-E-5-0, to get 50% off your Save the Dates. You can also get free personalized paper samples before you purchase that's Zola.com slash gals, promo code SAVE50, and treat you nuptials. Straight up. Are we ready for 
my case. Never. Probably so not. let's just, let's not even try. It's <laughs> really gruesome. Great. And I did it to myself. It's not even a fan pic. Mm -hmm. I just, I am who I am. She woke up and chose violence. Literally, yes. So around 8.30 p.m. on the evening of October 17th, 2006, the New Orleans Police Department received a call from an, from an employee of the Omni Royal Hotel reporting that they had discovered a body on the roof of their parking garage. Ooh. Is this the case from Unsolved Mysteries? It no. This is covered oh, in... Oh, okay. No. Oh, okay. That's yeah. similar but different. Yes, that's I know. fucking bonkers. That case is bonkers. That did not take place in New Orleans as far okay. as I remember. But yes. Yeah, si yeah. Okay. Similar vibes, although this case is not a mystery. Okay. Okay. Just just gruesome. Great. Great. Much preferred. So Found this body on the roof of the parking garage of a hotel. Upon arrival, police inspected the man's body and immediately determined that he had either fallen, possibly been pushed, or jumped from the hotel's roof and died on impact. Hmm. The distance from the hotel roof to the parking garage roof was five stories. Ooh. When they began searching the body for ID, they found something extremely troubling. A note in the man's front pants pocket that read, quote, this is not accidental. I had to take my own life to pay for the one I took. Oh, my God. If you send a patrol to 826 North Rampart, you will find the dismembered corpse of my girlfriend, Addie, in the oven, on the <gasps> stove, and in the fridge. Mm, yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. Mm, mm -mm. Oh, I got chills. Along this. with full documentation on the both of us and a full signed confession from myself, Zach Bowen. Bye. Whoo, that's I'm creepy. Gonna slowly back away. Also in his pockets were army dog tags and the keys to the apartment described in the note. Officers were immediately dispatched to the address, and what they found was a scene beyond anyone's worst nightmares. Oh my god. So hit me with it. <laughs> I've had my morning. My body is ready. I'm ready. <laughs> Hit me with it. <laughs> God. That's a true crime fan right there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I shouldn't laugh. This is horrible. This oh, is a woman's it's murder. Awful. The air conditioner was blasting, keeping the apartment cooled to refrigerator like temperatures despite the warm weather outside. I did read somewhere that it was set to 60, which isn't that cool. Yeah, but if it's really hot outside, that yeah, they're it wor it's feel, working hard yeah, to make yeah, that happen. Right. Yeah. It was a choice. Mm -hmm. Eerily, the walls of the apartment were spray painted with dark messages such as, quote, I'm a failure. And instructions that someone should contact Bowen's ex-wife to tell her that he loved her mm. after he just murdered his girlfriend. Okay. A lot to unpack here. Yeah, there's a lot going on. Also, we had a creepy neighbor once and Zach like helped him carry something into his house and there was Don't like, like that. spray painted stuff on the walls and like a shrine at one point and a pot of water just like rapid boiling on mm -mm. the stove with nothing mm -mm. else happening. Ooh. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Yeah. Mm -mm. I have a friend here who used to live in a house and in the basement. I forgot the details, but the gist is in the basement, there was like some sort of column, like an old, uh, like a chimney like or some sort oh, of okay. shoot. And, like, all the way up in this column, all the way up through the house, there were, like, symbols, like, Ooh. etched. It, like, somebody used to live down there, and they were, like, deep into something. They were, like, receiving messages, and they etched all these symbols of everywhere. That's, oh. a, that's a pass for me. <laughs> yeah. No. <laughs> you are not getting your security deposit back. No. No. <laughs> You have cursed the house. You do not get your security deposit back. This it's column in the was lease. structural. Yeah. 
<laughs> my house is cursed because Corey smashed his toe a few years ago when we were putting on the front porch and his toenail eventually turned black and fell off and <laughs> never came back. <laughs> one night one night he just decided to light it on fire, the the, the toenail that separated from his foot. So he and kept then, the nail? It had, it had happened that night. So it fell off. He lit it on fire. And then when the it just burned, the fire burnt out. And then he he, he goes, I'm going to curse our house. And he threw the charred, blackened toenail up into, like, the rafters of the not-quite-yet-finished porch. And it's still there. You did marry a grand, BD. Yeah, you two are <laughs> definitely well matched. Yeah, yeah. that's for Love fucking is sure. Real. Yep, I there's still someone have a... for everyone. <laughs> I still haven't decided where to bury his gallbladder. It's still in okay. my freezer. Hey, what's next uh, in your case? Well, what's next in my case is not going to make that any better. But Great. well, it'll be a pile on. Okay. So. One message on the wall, similar to the note in Bowen's pocket, instructed police to look on the stove. Hate it. Hate that. (sighs) And in a pot on one of the burners. It was a pot roast. That's it. Just fed the neighborhood. Case closed. You wish. Oh, God. In a pot on one of the burners was a severed human head. (gasps) And it had been charred beyond recognition, but later was attributed to... Zach's girlfriend, Addie Hall. Oh, God. A pot on another burner Uh, contained the body's hands and feet. It was in boiling water? Or was it it just cooking? Well, we will get to it. Okay. When police looked into the oven itself, they found a large roasting pan containing pieces of arms and legs. Nope. Which had also been cooked. Nope. 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 I have so many questions. (laughs) Amanda. Amanda. Nope. By themselves? Sometimes when I'm really stressed, I just come up here and just... No, not by themselves. Smell my candles. (laughs) Serenity by By Jan. I'm sorry. I'm not laughing at this woman's horrible murder. I'm just... I'm so uncomfortable. That's what is happening right now. So um, the horrified officers also noticed that there appeared to be seasoning. <laughs> that, that was my question. <laughs> well, but was it okay? So they're seasoned. Were they cooked with anything like carrots, onions, Root, roots, and tubers? <laughs> <laughs> you almost made yourself throw up. Yes. <laughs> yes. Other vegetables. I saw. One report that said that there were other vegetables like carrots and onions. So the intention presumably was to eat it. I think the intention and probably the execution. I think there was some consumed. I think Zach did eat some of it. Okay. (laughs) Amanda. I have left (laughs) the earth. Amanda's reaction versus Lucy's reaction. That was my question. (laughs) Yeah. But the but, but so the hands and the feet and the head were they in water or were they just that I don't know. simmering in their own juices. That I don't know. Do we we don't need to know. Cooking. We, you to don't paint, need to you to paint the picture. No, some... you don't need a picture painted. It's clear. It's clear on its own. It's not clear enough. Some no. level no. of cookery, advanced ish cookery had been undertaken. Okay. When they opened the fridge, they found the body's torso wrapped in a trash bag. Oh. When news got out of Addie's incomprehensibly gruesome murder and Bowen's subsequent attention-seeking suicide, friends of the couple were in a state of horrified disbelief. It's mm-hmm. very dramatic, all of yeah. it. Yeah. According to those who knew them, Zach and Addie had had a tumultuous relationship. But like they also, it was, it was pretty codependent, and it was very, you know, all or nothing mm-hmm. kind of. Mm-hmm. So they both drank pretty heavily and would often get into screaming fights. Addie accused Zach of cheating on her. We don't know if that's true or not, but it probably is. 
they were kind of both pretty like big partiers in New Orleans. To some outsiders, it seemed just like a situation where Addie's temper would flare up and then the com- the couple would like reconcile, but nobody seemed to like think that there was abuse happening, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Like it was mostly situational after they'd been drinking and of course alcohol makes you... Yeah, it just seemed like they were in like a toxic shitty relationship mm-hmm. but it wasn't like they weren't like physically violent with each other right. as far as people knew right mm-hmm. but the fights were loud and drew attention and like neighbors called police mm-hmm. and like the fights were intense but yeah it didn't seem like he was an abuser right and obviously we know abuse comes in many forms mm-hmm. and this is just well he ended up murdering her so, so like, yeah yeah, yeah. I, I'm not def- I'm just saying this is what people believe right, the exactly. situation to be. So nobody seemed to think that she was in danger. Sure. Just that it was like a shitty relationship and they should probably fucking break up. Mm-hmm. So the couple had met in 2005 when they were both 27 years old and working as bartenders in New Orleans's French Quarter. At first, their relationship had simply been flirtatious, so they were both, like, outgoing and charming and, like, kind of, you know, free spirits. Mm -hmm. Um, Addie was an aspiring poet, and she was pretty well known around town as just kind of like this. There are pictures of her on the drive. Like, she's got these cute star sunglasses, and, Mm -hmm. you know, she's living her life. She's a creative spirit. Yeah, she's in her late 20s bartending in New Orleans. Like, how fucking fun does that sound? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they eventually began casually dating, but only a few weeks into their relationship, Hurricane Katrina hit. Mm -hmm. And Addie invited Zach to stay with her to, like, weather the storm and get through the storm. Mm -hmm. And then their relationship kind of quickly grew into something more. So what started as kind of casual, suddenly they're, like, living together, going through this really intense... Trauma bonding. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then Zach and Addie both actually enjoyed, if you can say that, the weeks following Katrina. First of all, the French Quarter was relatively unscathed because it's a wealthy district. Mm -hmm. So they their, like, you know, home was fine. Right. They didn't have electricity, but they lived by candlelight in Addie's apartment and they would like barter with neighbors for things they needed. And it kind of felt like like a camp, like an urban mm-hmm. camping thing. You know, they're like, it's like an experience, right? Mm-hmm. Some pe- I mean, some people literally died. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I'm just talking about these two people right. and their experience, which was cushioned in a lot of privilege. Mm hmm. They also began caring for the stray cats in in the neighborhood and gathering with neighbors around a large communal bonfire that they built in the street. Mm -hmm. They even continued bartending. So they set up like a little makeshift operation on the street and served cocktails to people who came by. Love that. So, yeah, it was like a fun trauma. Fun trauma. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If police officers walked by, Addie would flash them to just be like, woo! Like, Ish. we're <laughs> to part- partying. Yeah. Whatever. This is trauma sussy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the couple's, quote, colorful survivalism attracted media attention, and they were featured in a New York Times profile of people who had decided not to flee in the aftermath of Katrina, despite having the resources to do so. Mm-hmm. Would not recommend. Mm-hmm. But they were, like, as a couple, they were profiled in the New York Times as, like, look at these two kids Mm -hmm. having fun. Making the best out of it. So, in fact, they enjoyed the post-Katrina scene so much that they struggled with the return to normal life when conditions in the city improved. And suddenly they had to, like, just go back to paying bills and Mm -hmm. going to work and whatever. But they decided to remain living together as a couple and move into a new apartment where they would both be on the lease instead of just Addie's apartment. So they found this place at 826 North Rampart Street, which was located above a business called Priestess Miriam's Voodoo Spiritual Temple. Ooh. Mm -hmm. Love that. But the charmed early days of their love were quickly fading. It wears off quick when you move in together. Turns let me out. just let me just be real clear about that. 
<laughs> How are you doing? I'm fine. I just don't have <laughs> any questions about anyone's bowels, habits, any of those things. Not a mystery anymore? Not a single mystery to be at, had. At least you have more than one bathroom. Yeah, that helps. With That helps. That is fucking necessary. Oh, uh, our relationship would not survive sharing a bathroom. Yeah. It simply would not. Mm -hmm. When Corey and I moved in together, we were also living with our friend Jake. So it was me and two dudes and one bathroom. Mm -mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -mm. We lived with another couple in Boston. So it was two couples and one bathroom. Mm -mm. Oh, and honestly, God. it was fine because we were young and I didn't have IBS yet. Mm. <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> times have changed. It was fine for the for a while until Zach and I both got food poisoning, mm. and then it was like a bridesmaids. Yeah, the oh, hell so. situation. It was bad. Anyway, okay. Hot lava. <laughs> Look away. <laughs> okay, so. <laughs> Back to this couple. So according to those who knew them well, both of their easygoing, free-spirited natures were concealing some deeper mm. pre-Katrina trauma. Mm -hmm. Not fun trauma. Yeah. They had both suffered uh, from PTSD. Addie had been a victim of childhood sexual abuse and then a, of a string of abusive relationships as an adult. Mm. And so before Zach, she had been wary of entering into another relationship with a man because of her past experiences. But then with Zach, it started casual. And then it just kind of like Katrina just kind of accelerated everything. And then yep. mm -hmm. it kind of happened like without her planning to. Mm -hmm. Like when you are like, I just want to be single for a while. And then you mm -hmm. inevitably meet someone the next day. Totally. Yep. So she had also been diagnosed with bipolar disorder and was often pretty inconsistent about taking her medication. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure like that had to do with her drinking as well, because mm -hmm. probably a lot of meds like you're not supposed to drink heavily on them and she wanted to. Mm -hmm. And like you're if you're drinking every night and you're, you know, you just kind of get drunk and forget to take your meds. Yeah, right. Probably helps contribute yeah. to the inconsistency mm -hmm. for sure. Zach, at 18 years old, had met and fell in love with his ex-wife, Laura, who was 10 years older than him. And so he got married really young, like at 18 or 19. And um, they married, had two children. He enlisted in the military because it seemed like the best option to support his young family. He then spent several years serving in Kosovo and Iraq, um, including time at Abu Ghraib. Mm -hmm. Ooh. So around the time he finished his overseas tours and was discharged from the army, his wife left him and took the two kids with her, which is a very common thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, like they got married really young, one, and then, you know, most of their marriage, she's at home alone with the kids. He's serving overseas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really They're both hard. growing up. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess she's older, but whatever. That's a lot to deal with. Yeah. So it seems that the heightened experience of Katrina had allowed both Zach and Addie to forget some of their past troubles for a short time, and then they both found it extremely difficult to adjust back to normal life afterwards. And so they both began drinking more heavily than usual um, and regularly using cocaine. Mm -hmm. Soon they were fighting constantly, and friends wondered why they didn't just break up. On October 4th, 2006, Addie went to her landlord to ask that Zach be taken off the lease because he had cheated on her and she had made the decision to kick him out. She wanted to keep the apartment and she wanted him off the lease. Mm -hmm. But the landlord denied her request, claiming that he didn't want to be involved in the dispute. And the conversation kind of ended there. She like left frustrated. Mm -hmm. Um. And the landlord was just like, like, figure out your shit. I don't want to be involved in your relationship drama. Which, like, I, f for the most part, am not pro-landlord in, like, any way, shape, or form. But there's probably legality to... About one tenant. I just want... I'm mad at my boyfriend. Right. Here's, my, here's the story I'm going to tell you. Like, to protect both parties on the lease, You'd you probably can't just go, need both parties to come... Exactly. And, ...and say, or, like, agree... It so, like, like, that's he, one of those situations where I'm like, okay, I get that the landlord's not just going to take the other I, paying yeah, renter I off the done lease. the same thing. In without yeah. more than just, yeah, that's kind of fair. Yeah. I feel like 
I don't, obviously I wasn't there, so I don't know the conversation. It sounds like the landlord was maybe more dismissive of than that. Sure. Like, whereas the landlord could have said, like, that's fine, but he needs to sign this. Right. Yeah. You know, like, I can't just take him off the lease, but if he agrees to it, then yep. fine. But right. it sounds like he was just like, I'm not, like, fuck off. Figure I'm, it out and leave me yeah. out of it. Well, he yeah. also probably was, like, sick of sick of them as tenants like they sure, yeah. there it was a lot of drama i don't know mm-hmm. who knows but sadly this conversation with the landlord was the last time that anyone besides zach would see addy alive oh, oh my god. god so the details of what happened next are very well documented because as police discovered upon a more thorough search of the apartment zach had left an eight page confession letter that gotta love a manifesto mm-hmm. in the pages of Addie's journal detailing the minutia of his crime. So we're just gonna further violate her by, by writing, writing this it in, in her journal, her fucking journal. I know. I thought that too. Yeah, that's. <clears throat> so he strangled Addie to death around one a.m. on October fifth. After which he sexually violated her corpse. This guy is all. Over the place. Yes. Yes. Ugh. The next morning, he got up and went to work. When he returned home, he moved Addie's body to the bathtub and dismembered it before meticulously cleaning the apartment. He obviously did not know about luminol. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Her remains would stay in the apartment for almost t- two weeks. Mm-hmm. Well, I was going to say, that is like two weeks between her death and his death Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. while zach went about his life as usual going to work he's a fucking bartender oh my god Ugh. meeting up with friends for drinks socializing and nobody's like where's people were asking yeah okay so we will get to that but friends who saw him during this period did not suspect that anything was wrong in fact he seemed in better spirits than he had in some time God, I hate that. Ew. Uh When they inquired about Addie's whereabouts, he told them that she had left him and moved back to North Carolina. And this somewhat surprised people because Addie loved New Orleans. And didn't even say goodbye to anyone. To anybody. Mm -hmm. I'm not buying it. I mean, clearly I know that's not what happened. (laughs) I'm not not buying buying it. it. Mm -mm. (laughs) Check the stove. (laughs) Oh, no. Call a priest. Something tells me. She's Oof. in the oven. No, 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 no. Um, but at the same time, it did seem sort of within her character to just like impulsively mm-hmm. move without notifying anyone because she was impulsive. She was a free spirit. She, it's possible. Like if if right, I if somebody was like, well, Kenyon just she just upped and left. You'd be like, no, no. she fucking didn't. No, Call she didn't. the priest. You know how long it takes her to pack. To yeah. go for like one week to Minnesota. It's Just your not, meds alone. It's, it's a yeah. 48 hour process packing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But Addie, you know, she could, it's possible. Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, according to his written confessions, uh, Zach had decided to cook Addie's body to make the remains easier to dispose of. Yeah, by digesting them. That's not. Sir? He wasn't thinking clearly. No. He also repeatedly burned himself with cigarettes to punish himself for, quote, all the ways he was a failure and for the fact that he felt no remorse for the murder. He felt remorse for not feeling any remorse? Yes. No. (laughs) No. No. (laughs) Yeah. That's his diagnosis. This guy is. Something's going on here. Something. Well, definitely PTSD. Right, that we know. I mean, I guess left. I un- don't know. I'm not treated a so much. Can yeah. happen. I think we we would need an actual psychiatrist or psychologist right. to actually study this man. Wow. And, and unfortunately, we can't alive. because yeah, yeah. There's no way to know. Mm-hmm. I mean, what's what's so bizarre is how he had friends he had a social life he had a job a network of support so do sociopaths i know and a diagnosis at least to some extent which Mm -hmm. indicates he likely had access to some services 
Through the military, yeah. Right. Ugh. Yeah. It's just, it's so sad. Yeah. Was he diagnosed with PTSD? Yes. I believe so. Mm-hmm. But like, he served two full tours. Mm-hmm. So maybe even more. I think I know two of for a fact. So I don't know. Wow. Hmm. The final pages of his confession in Addie's journal read in part. Uh, can you imagine if I read eight pages right now? Ugh, I'd be. <laughs> Upset. Then I would turn to alcohol before <laughs> noon. Quote, halfway through the task, I stopped and thought about what I was doing. The decision to halt the first idea and move to plan B, the crime scene you are now in, came after a while. I scared myself not by the action of calmly strangling the woman I've loved for one and a half years and then desecrating her body but by my entire lack of remorse. This isn't adding up. That is the scariest fucking thing I've ever heard. I don't buy any of this. The calmly part, I can't. I've Mm -hmm. known for forever how horrible of a person I am, ask anyone, and decided to quit my jobs and spend the 1500 cash I had being happy until I killed myself. His words. So that's what I did. Good food, good drugs, good strippers, good friends, and any loose ends I may have had. I didn't contact any of my family, so that'll explain the shock. And had a fantastic time living out my days. It's just about time now. Mm -mm. This just... uh, He's putting on this air of being so self-aware... That he feels remorse, that he doesn't feel remorse, that he strangled her so calmly. This is just, it's, it's creepy. It's pathological. It's very, all it's, well, of it's it very is disassociated. so over the top. It's so yeah. over the top. All it's of like, it. Yeah, this is bizarre. I, and I she, feel like. She had taken him in. Right. During the storm and everything. And like. But clearly she was, like, done and fed up, which we know is... Yep, the most dangerous time. Yep. Mm -hmm. After writing this entry, Zach went to the Omni Royal Hotel where the security cameras captured him approaching the edge of the roof with a drink in his hands and looking over the ledge and then backing up several times. Finally, he downed the last of his drink and then threw himself over the edge. Oh. Oh. No. The news of the couple's deaths left many in the city reeling. And this trauma was brought up once again when, about 10 years after Addie's murder, a woman who referred to herself as Mary Voodoo Queen Milan rented the building on Rampart Street and opened a business called the Bloody Mary Haunted Museum. Is this the same as the business that was below, the Miriam? No. Wasn't she voodoo queen? There There's probably was, a lot of voodoo queens. There was a different voodoo shop beneath their apartment mm-hmm. when they lived there. Oh, right. Okay. But they're not associated. Not related. No. Okay. Yeah. Although it was not immediately apparent that the museum, quote unquote, would focus on Addie's death, visitors mm-hmm. soon reported that a ticket allowed you to view the apartment upstairs, which had been decorated as a kitschy haunted house covered not with okay. blood spatter. No, that is so fucked up. Oh, my yeah. God. That showcased the very stove and fridge where Eddie's remains had been discovered. That makes me physically sick. That's so fucked. Ugh. And I know that we do a true crime comedy show. So, like, I am aware of yeah. that. And that is a line that is past the line for a lot of people. And I mm. do understand that. Although we try to do our best. Mm-hmm. But, like, this... Yeah. It feels awful. And I've been to haunted houses. I guess it's more like enough time has elapsed. Well, I there's my, something just so purely exploitative about this particular setup. The fake blood spatter is old. And only ten me. years after her murder. Mm-hmm. It's not I went to the Velisca Axe house a month ago and right. walked through the house. Mm-hmm. I know. There's some there's like a line. Somewhere, and maybe it is just like when enough time has elapsed, like the Lizzie Borden mm-hmm. house and whatever. But like this feels egregious, yeah. very off. I think it's the drama of her death and dismemberment, mm-hmm. the whole thing, the mm-hmm. fake blood, 
Mm-hmm. And the fact that it was just a few years later, all mm-hmm. of those things kind of wrapped up just makes this feel very unpalatable. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So friends of the couple and others in the neighborhood were outraged at the exploitation of the crime and of someone stirring up memories of something that they were still struggling to process. Mm-hmm. And yeah, like her parents are still living, yeah. presumably. Yeah. This is not, yeah. If there's still people reeling from the trauma of the crime itself, Mm -hmm. given the nature of the crime. Yeah. Yeah. Read the room. So Milan, uh, the haunted museum owner, defended her business, stating that she was simply educating people about the story of Hall and Bowen and that, quote, Katrina was an important chapter and they're an important part of that chapter, which like. That's grasping at straws. Feels like a bit of a stretch, although people had started to call the case and Zach Bowen the Katrina cannibal. Ooh. And like cannibal with a K, obviously. I mean, he didn't eat her, though. I think there's a part of it, too, that bugs me where it's like their loved ones are still very much alive. Right. Yeah. And so this is someone who's making money off of their trauma while like. Was any of that money going to the family? Was any of that money going to like mental health resources for veteran services? Like, war, Hi, like doubtful. That's what I mean. It's like if you I mean if we're this, making if, money off of this story and they're still alive. Yes, absolutely. I'm just saying just we're honest. also not giving tours of like right the murder site. I feel like there could have been a way where if sh- this person had like collaborated somehow with the family to make sure that this was like a victim focused situation. Right, but that's not at all what the intent of the business was. Also, it feels very uh, offensive to voodoo practitioners. Mm -hmm. This Mm -hmm. has nothing to do with voodoo. Yeah. Like, this is just a horrible murder that happened to take place in New Orleans. Like a horrible, toxic relationship slash a veteran not getting the resources that they fucking desperately need. Yeah. Yeah. And also, none of it, like, none of it sits right. And enjoy this last episode of our podcast. Yeah, maybe we just, need to find a new career because this out. is very ishy, and I don't like it. I am her, and she is me. So, like we said, the focus of the museum was not on Hurricane Katrina or its victims, mm-hmm. or respectfully telling Addie's story, and rather, it just attempted to lump all of that also in with like popular supernatural New Orleans legends, and it mm-hmm. just doesn't make a lot of sense. And Milan also displayed like blood spattered photographs of Zach and Addie next to images of Delphine LaLaurie, like the LaLaurie mansion yeah. and Marie Laveau, labeling them as the city's oldest and newest spirits. Yikes. Do better, Milan. <laughs> it's not good. Oh, there's a lot happening. You know, even though this isn't an unsolved mystery, as you said, there seems to be a lot. That's still in question, mostly about this guy. Well, yeah, Just because his motivations we and only what have his fucking unhinged eight page manifesto. Yeah. It's just so and a lot of just like weird. bewildered friends and family being yeah. like, what the fuck? I don't know. That- they were in their late 20s and in a shitty couple but like didn't see this coming Mm -hmm. who could see this coming no one no one i i I think even when you are aware of the existence of mental health issues and struggle and even like even if an individual expresses that they may become violent toward themselves or others this is still like so far beyond the scope of imagination yeah it's so wild yeah very dark stuff this yeah. is maybe the weirdest. Yeah. This is top five weirdest. I didn't even realize how dark it was until I was too far down the rabbit hole to like mm-hmm. back out. Yeah. But yeah. I mean, it's horrible, but it's also kind of like fascinating. It's just mm-hmm. whew, it's a, like, yeah. Okay. So long story short, abusive relationship ends in murder, suicide. Cool. Tale as old as time. Right. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, very, very common. But just the way, oh, just the way, I don't know. This is weird. It's fucking crazy wild. <clears throat> yeah, and sad. Mm-hmm. And don't yeah. go to that museum. No. No. That's that's a line for me, dog. Mm-hmm. All right. Oof. Wow. Well, thanks. 
Should we hear a word from our sponsors? Oh, Dear God. God. <laughs> so it's pretty well known that I love my Sauvignon Blanc. Love mm-hmm. it. But every once in a while, I kind of want to I don't want to break out. I want to break free. I want to try yep. something new. And then mm-hmm. I have absolutely no idea what I'm doing. Yep. <laughs> no clue where to start. I don't know what pairs well with what, blah, blah, blah. It's just like a, a mystery. Mm-hmm. And that is why I recently discovered wine.com. And it's like a s- personal sommelier. It's like having Amanda in my back pocket. It is, but better. They know more <laughs> than me. It's not only like having me in your back pocket. It's like having me and your personal wine store Oh yeah, in your back pocket. Like, it's all of the things. This is the world's largest wine store. You are not going to find a bigger or broader selection of wine anywhere. And this massive selection is delivered right to your door. Okay, so wine.com handles your wine with great care before you even place your order by doing their own warehousing and fulfillment. I love that. They're part of the process from beginning, middle to end. And then you have it mailed to you and, you know, adult signature is required. You got to be 21. Delivery options are kind of up to you. It's on your schedule. You can choose your delivery date. You can opt to pick your wine up at one of thousands of Walgreens. Hi, I do that. FedEx office or other local pickup sites across the nation. Either way, shipping is on your schedule. There is nothing worse than not being able to pick when your wine is going to come and then missing that delivery window because you have to sign for it and show your ID and then you're like running after the truck. I have fully halted recording Mm -hmm. an episode of our show Mm -hmm. because I hear a knock at the door and I know it's the wine that I've ordered. Oh, yeah. Well, (laughs) I was out of town with Bill and I had a wine delivery and I literally yelled through my video doorbell at the guy (laughs) and then texted the person who was house sitting for us so that we wouldn't miss it. Like you never have to think about that again with wine.com because you can just schedule it. And I highly, highly, highly recommend the stewardship membership for only $49 because with that stewardship membership, you get free shipping year round, no minimum purchase. You order one bottle or a hundred bottles and the shipping is free every time. Honestly, that membership price, that $49 pays for itself with just a couple of orders because wine is very expensive to ship. It's really heavy. Super heavy. And then you can use that membership to send gifts throughout the year to family and friends. you got a housewarming that you just don't want to go to because you don't want to leave your house. Send them some wine. Send some to grandma. Send the, send some to some friend for your birthday. To me. Whatever. Yeah, send it to Lucy. <laughs> Who cares? You get free shipping with that stewardship membership. Um, and... Like Lucy said, it's like having me in your pocket, so you get expert guidance to help you choose. This is the only site that offers extensive and free professional ratings and tasting notes. And whether you are a novice or an expert, live chat with wine experts to help you find the perfect bottle for every occasion. If you're planning on cooking something really fun and you don't know what to pair with it, you can hop on wine.com and go, hey, listen, I'm making you know, filet mignon. I need to know what to pair with this. They will make a recommendation, then you order it and you have it shipped to your house. It could not be any easier. And their filter options are the best. So if you know you want to try something like a Sauve Blanc or a similar, you know, Mm -hmm, white, mm -hmm. you can sort your options by price. You can go by vintage. You can try a specific year. You can go by varietal. You can go by region. You only want to do a Spanish white, white. Great. Put it in the filter. So many amazing options to help you pick what's going to be best. It's so easy and really fun to explore that website, honestly. So Mm -hmm. go to wine.com forward slash crime and get $50 off your first order. Terms apply. One more time. Go to wine.com forward slash crime and get 50 bucks off your first order. One more time. Terms apply. Treat your wine life. Treat it. We're excited to tell you about the new hit podcast, Strange and Unexplained with Daisy Egan. Do Mm. you believe in ghosts? How about Bigfoot? Yes, (laughs) absolutely. Do you think it's strange and fascinating that a four-year-old in Oklahoma could look at a black and white picture of a man from the 1930s and say, that was me before? Oh, I just got chills. (laughs) And then provide actual verifiable details of that man's life? (laughs) If so, Strange and Unexplained with Daisy Egan is about to be your new favorite podcast. Yup. Daisy Egan is a Tony Award winning actor, writer, and true crime fanatic. But she's also a skeptic. 
So each week she looks at real stories of hauntings, disappearances, UFO encounters, the Bermuda Triangle, (laughs) unsolved murders and disappearances, and anything else that feels just beyond what we can easily make sense of. Daisy is your guide into these stories, but she's also like, show me the receipts. Incredible. Strange and Unexplained with Daisy Egan is one of the most popular new podcasts on the internet. So what are you waiting for? Find Strange and Unexplained with Daisy Egan wherever you get your podcasts. Knowledge is power. And when you know more, you can make better decisions for your body, your health, and your future. There aren't many decisions bigger than having a kid, but for many people, their fertility is indeed a big question mark. It is. And that is why Modern Fertility was created. It's the easy and affordable way to test your fertility hormones at home with a simple finger prick. Then you mail it in with a prepaid label and you'll get your personalized results within 10 days. It's amazing. Traditional testing with your doctor can cost over a thousand dollars, but Modern Fertility gets you the same information at $159 which, if you're doing the math, is a fraction of the price. And if you go to modernfertility.com slash gals, you can also get $20 off your test. Also, the hits just keep on coming. (laughs) If you have an HSA or an FSA, you can put those dollars toward Modern Fertility and you will get insight into your hormone levels, how many eggs you have, and other important fertility factors. The results go deep into what every hormone means and you can also talk one-on-one with a fertility nurse to review your results and options for next steps. I personally am not having children, but I'm a type one diabetic. I have a weird period. I've had, you know, been very concerned about whether or not I might have PCOS. And I'm just like interested in knowing about the hormones in my body and what to expect of if I'm going to like experience early menopause, like these other hormonal things that have to do with your reproductive system, whether or not you're planning on reproducing. And it's all really good information to know. So I loved doing my kit. It took two seconds. I mean, like I said, I'm a diabetic, so doing the finger prick was like nothing. It was a walk in the park. And then you send it all off, and then you go over your results with a professional, and they make sure that you understand everything that you're seeing. It could not be easier. So if you want kids today, or maybe one day in the future, or honestly, even not at all, you can get clinically sound information about your body that can help you make the best decision that's right for you and just, you know, treat your knowledge a little bit. Oh, yeah. Knowledge is power. Mm -hmm. So right now, Modern Fertility is offering our listeners $20 off the test when you go to modernfertility.com slash gals, G-A-L-S. That means that your test will cost $139 instead of the several hundred or even thousand plus dollars it could cost at a doctor's office. Get $20 off your fertility test when you go to modernfertility.com slash gals. One more time, modernfertility.com slash gals. Treat your knowledge. Treat it. Are you ready for my case? Probably not. I've, like, burst my own bubble. You definitely have, uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Je suis deflated. Changed. Mm-hmm. Changed the tenor of that I'm going to put some chapstick on. Chap balm. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, let's try and get through this. Okay. <laughs> so today... I'm going to be talking about Clementine Bar- Barnabet, and I just, Barnabay. or Barnabet, probably. Barnabet. Barnabet. Um, <laughs> and I just want to state Dynabit. right here at the top, she is a black woman, and there is ample racism surrounding this case and how Clementine was represented, which is not okay, even when that person might be a murderer. Just getting that out. Okay. Yeah. She's a murderer, but not because she happens to Well, be and she might not even be a murderer. So we'll get to All it. Right. So Clementine has gone down in history as the first African-American serial killer. But was that actually the case? Mm. So Clementine was believed to be born around 1894 in St. Martinville, Louisiana, before her family moved to Lafayette in 1909, which is only eight years before my grandmother was born. Shortly after moving to Lafayette, a rash of brutal murders of African-American families living along the Southern Pacific Railroad line began to occur between 1911 and 1912. Whole families? Whole families. Ooh. The carnage began west of Lafayette, Louisiana, in the city of Crowley. 
There, on February 11th, 1911, investigators found the dead bodies of Walter J. Byers, his wife, and their young son. Judging from the evidence at the crime scene, the assailant had entered the Byers' home uh, through a back window, and the Byers, like I said, they were black, and their home was located in the, like, segregated, quote-unquote, colored corner of the city. That's not my term. That is just historically what that was called in the time. This indicated to investigators that the killer was also likely black because a white intruder would have been, like, immediately noticed in the area. Like, any prowler. Mm -hmm. That's just not an area where white folks ever went. So reports described that the family Mm -hmm. had been, had been, quote, brained with an axe, which was brazenly left at the scene. Hate that. Yeah. Which was left. Not into that. Phrase. No, and it's the it is the phrase that every newspaper used at the yeah. time. Brained. Yeah, newspapers. The worst. Old timey newspapers. The terminology is so horrifying. Graphic. Yeah. yeah. And like, there's so much lingo. It's not great. It's great, and it's not great. Yeah. <laughs> um. So the axe was left at the scene, covered in blood and like tissue and brain matter, like just left there. Less than two weeks later, on the morning of February 4th, 1911, Nina Martin was beginning her morning routine with her son, Lesamie Felix, <gasps> and Lesamie went next... Damien, Damien Faye. Faye. Lesamie. So cute. <laughs> went next door to their Lafayette home to visit with his aunt, Mimi Andrews, who is Nina's sister. So the sisters lived next door to each other, and they, I think they, yeah, they both had kids, and then the cousins all played together. Okay. Nina oh, and fun. Mimi. Yeah. Fresh. Lesamy Felix. Yeah. Presh. Mm-hmm. I know. <laughs> yeah, Lucy's really feeling this family and their well, name. Nina. Nina is so I could see you having a girl named Nina. Mm-hmm. It's on my list. <laughs> so Lesamy Felix returned almost immediately, screaming that his aunt and uncle had been murdered. Nina rushed over to her sister's house and was horrified to discover that Lesamy was telling the truth. Her sister Mimi and brother-in-law Alexander, along with their son. Joachim and their daughter, Agnes, were found murdered exactly how the buyers had been, all brutally slashed with an axe that was then left at the scene. It appeared that the family had been killed while they slept, and they were, so, like, these were small homes, and the families often just yeah. had one room and sh- for sleeping and shared one bed. Mm-hmm. So the family was still in the bed that they all shared, and in a gruesome tableau, Alexander and Mimi were moved post-mortem and posed in kneeling positions beside the bed as though they were praying over the children. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Okay, that takes the cake. Yeah. That is the cr- Creepiest? What the yeah. fuck is wrong with you guys? It's not <laughs> this my is a fault. lot for the morning. Listen, I didn't know. I, I thought we were going to be recording this last night. So I went yeah. deep into the archives. Lucy's, Lucy's segment was like, and then the Spanish and maps and Isn't rivers it gross that pelicans. there's blood on the pelican's chest? Bleeding pelicans was the worst part of mine. Well. And global warming and... Yeah, that's pretty bad. Yeah, genocide and whatever. Because these scenes were so similar, the sheriff and his men suspected that the murder of the Andrews family was also the killer of the Byers family, and the sheriff named their primary suspect a recently, according to newspapers from the time, quote, escaped lunatic named Garkon Godfrey. Maybe Garkon? I I don't know. Sure, maybe. I'm calling him Garkon. (laughs) Garkon. So in each of these cases, entire families were wiped out in the dead of night with an axe as the murder weapon. And the choice of posed. Well, yeah, in at least one of these cases, they were posed. There's, we'll get to more of it. Oh my god! The choice of an axe appears opportunistic because it was always an axe belonging to the family. Because like that was just every family has it. Yeah, one like the fucking Velisca. Right. Also mm-hmm. located near a railroad. Which we will get we'll get to it, Lucy. Could don't you worry. That is a theory, and we will get to it. The man on the train. <gasps> and we will get to it. <laughs> I'm already there, baby. Jesus Christ. Hit me with it. Catch up. <laughs> oh, okay. So because it was always an axe belonging to the family that was killed, and therefore the the same axe was never used twice. Quote, while the family was asleep, the murderer would locate and take the family axe and then break into the victim's home. Once inside, they would proceed to kill everyone in the house. Entire families were taken out all at once. Oh, my word. So wild. So in a surprise to investigators, the next killing took place outside of Louisiana. 
On March 22nd, 1911, Louis Cassaway, his wife, and their three children were all killed with an axe in their home, which was located in San Antonio, Texas, which is over 400 miles away from Lafayette, Louisiana. But Those close to a railroad. Pretty close. Though the details were eerily similar, some major differences stood out. Obviously, the distance from the previous killings, but also that the previous families had been black families and the Cassaway family was mixed race. So Mrs. Cassaway was actually white and Mr. Cassaway was black and they had biracial children together. Investigators initially believed this murder was a hate crime that targeted a mixed race family, but couldn't shake the similarities to the Louisiana cases. So the sheriff in the Louisiana investigation soon named a new sus- suspect after ruling out Garkin Godfrey <laughs> no, Garkin. and receiving There's reports. No way it's Garkin. <laughs> I'm going for Garkin. Gherkin. Gherkin. <laughs> Sweet Gherkin Godfrey. Ooh, love some Gherkin. I know. That is an exclamation. Delicious. Sweet, Sweet Gherkin, Gherkin Godfrey. Godfrey. Go to bed. Go to bed. Call a priest. Le- <laughs> Lesame Felix. <laughs> Sweet Lesame Felix. Sweet Mimi Nina. Oh, rest in peace. Peace, sweet Mimi. Yeah. Um, and the sheriff had received reports of a Lafayette man who was boasting about murdering the Byers and Andrews families. The suspect Why would was you boast. Shut it's your always a mouth. drunk guy at the bar. I mean, <laughs> I I, I mean, don't. Know. Why would you murder a whole family? But also, why, but why would you murder a whole family? Why would you boast? And I'm still not convinced that this is the right person. Right. So it's like, yeah, could have been somebody just trying to sound tough. Exactly. So. That individual is Raymond Barnabay. Barnabat. Gar- Garkin Raymond Barnabat. Good <laughs> Lord. Raymond was a black man in 1911, so reports naming him as, quote, a petty criminal with a long rap sheet and a violent temper, which we still use those fucking buzzwords today, yeah. should be taken with a bucket of salt. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was mighty compelling to investigators when his lover came forward to tell them that Raymond had told her he'd murdered these families during a heated argument possibly to frighten her. So like not yeah. murdered them during a heated argument with them, but in he told heated, her yeah. while in an, in a heated argument with his partner that he had murdered these families and he could possibly have been saying that to yeah, like, he was like, watch out, scare her. Exactly. Yeah. Watch the slap. Exactly. So this was all the sheriff needed to make an arrest. So Raymond was taken into custody in the fall of 1911 and charged for the Louisiana and San Antonio murders. His daughter Clementine and son Zephyrin both tested against, testified against him in court, claiming to have seen their father return home covered in blood on more than one occasion. Wow. Their testimony, plus a whole lot of racism, was plenty for the jury to convict Raymond Barnabé for of murder in October of 1911. Why about, do we sound so suspicious that he did this? Why do we sound suspicious that he did it? Yeah. Or that he didn't do it? Yeah. I don't I guess I don't understand the question. Um uh, well <laughs> like why we, do I do sound we, like Do we think that the girlfriend and his children were coerced to testify? Do no. we think that he was a shitty violent dude that maybe didn't kill these people? Do I honestly think- have no idea. And okay. the reason I don't think he did it is coming right now. Okay. So a month later, while Raymond is behind bars, the axe murderer strikes again. Oh. On November 27th, 1911, the bodies of Norbert Randall and his wife Azima and their four children were found inside of their home in Lafayette. Eight-year-old Albert, six-year-old Renee, five-year-old Norbert Jr., and two-year-old Agnes had been beaten to death with the blunt side of the axe, while Norbert and Azima were, as they keep fucking saying in reports, brained. With the axe. Jesus Christ. But also the, mur- the names in this case are so exquisite. Stellar. Amazing. The murder weapon was once again left at the crime scene, though this time the axe had been partially washed. Also, isn't this a second child victim named Agnes? Uh, I think previously Agnes might have been one of the parents, but this is a second Agnes victim mm-hmm. for sure. I don't know if it's a child again with the same name, but... Definitely two with the same name. The town went into an immediate panic as the realization that they had likely jailed the wrong man and the killer was still at large was like sinking in. Mm -hmm. So about 150 residents rallied at the Good Hope Baptist Church in Lafayette to discuss their safety, encourage each other to sleep with weapons nearby, and demand action from the police. Yeah, (laughs) yeah, right? Sorry. That's what that's, I as I was reading this, I was like, they're stupid advice. That's what I was thinking as I read that note. I was like, 
they're encouraging well, you to just provide more murder weapons for the person who is You could using... sleep with your ex under your pillow. And then it'd be harder to get. Right. Better than your ex being like outside. Mm-hmm. Wasn't this your front an door? idea, an original idea for an episode? Remember before we started this podcast? We've done an axe murders episode. No, not mm-hmm. axes, but uh, like the li- like murderers who use one's own weapons against them. Yeah, mm-hmm. opportunistic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But like for as sure. an MO. Yeah. Yeah, we could do and that as an episode. I mean, yeah, that's sure. basically what's happening here. Yeah. Ted Bundy. So they also wanted more action from the police to keep the community safe. The mob demanded the Barnabay children be investigated. Because, you know, they put the the patriarch of the family in jail, and they're not going to look for other suspects, so it must be someone in the family. Okay, that's wild. Yeah. Yeah. So, police returned to the Barnaby family home in search of new evidence, and they found several sets of bloody clothes belonging to 17-year-old Clementine. Blood was also found on the door leading to Clementine's room. Although few believed then that a 17-year-old woman could carry out such gruesome crimes, Clementine was, arre- Clementine was arrested and uh, sent to the same Lafayette Parish jail as her father, Raymond. With both of them behind bars, the community expected the killings to stop, but they didn't. Oh, my God, this poor girl. Let yep. them both out. Jesus Christ. Well, and, like, the thing is, the, the these are marginalized individuals who have to like labor to survive. And so quite frankly, finding evidence of like blood when families are slaughtering their own meat, raising their own chickens, like, and we don't have a way to test it. It's it also like, sounds like, well, I mean, this guy also might have been abusive. Like absolutely. It, could know, have been. Abuse is very common nowadays, very common back then. Totally. And, you know, his partner had testified against him. So, I mean, it could just be from abuse in the home that yeah, there's it blood. sounds like really shoddy detective work anyway. I mean, so exactly. So who's to even say that there was blood on the fucking right. way? Right. Exactly. Also and we'll possible. kind of get to that, too. Okay, so they're both behind bars. The community expects these killings to stop, but they don't. In January of 1912, the Broussard family of Lake Charles, Louisiana, met a similar but clearly escalated fate. Oh, Quote, the murdered Broussard children had their blood drained into buckets left at the side of their beds. Uh. A message written in blood was left on one of the home's walls. It read, quote, when he maketh the inquisition for blood, he forgetteth not the cry of the humble, end quote. How are both of these cases in this episode so Bonkers and Louisiana, dark baby. And <laughs> blood written in messages and well, I'm upset with both. Of you. Yeah, <laughs> what it's a way wild. to start the day. It's a. I have to I'm go to the airport now. later and pretend to be normal. Fair. Oh God. So for decades, this inscription was cited as coming from Psalms. 912 of the King James Bible. However, the King James Bible actually reads, when he maketh inquisition for blood, he remembereth them. He forgetteth not the cry of the humble. The biblical quotation left behind at the Broussard crime scene was actually taken from the novel Uncle Tom's Cabin, which had originally misquoted the verse. Interesting. Okay. So Hmm. immediately the media went wild with what we've come to call satanic panic. So newspapers wrote a sensational or many sensational pieces about the children being used as sacrifices. They reported that the words human five were found written on the walls as well, like a signature. These claims were it's like they weren't super substantiated, but I don't know if this is true because like. Every because single of that time period, the exactly. investigation, you like can't trust what is said. You can't. There's trust no what's photo left out. Yeah, exactly. There's 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 photos of Clementine. There are no photos of these crime scenes. How popular was Uncle Tom's Cabin when it came out? I have no idea. I think it was pretty popular. Yeah. So having a copy of Uncle Tom's Cabin wouldn't really narrow it down much. Right. So, I mean, I don't know. But this was this was floating around whether or not there was stuff written in blood on the walls, which I don't not believe that that's true. That that story then in the hands of the media is just getting wildly sensationalized. Mm-hmm. Uncle and Tom's so, Cabin was a runaway bestseller. 
It mm -hmm. sold 10,000 copies in its first week. There yeah. you go. Yeah. Okay. So these claims in the paper were unsubstantiated, and the paper spread racist vitriol about voodoo worshippers being responsible for the murders because obviously the families are black families and they're looking at a black suspect. So this is how we're going to like paint this. You'd think this would be the perfect way for Clementine and Raymond to get released from jail because now more murders are happening while they're clearly not responsible. Yeah. And for Raymond, they're it probably was. not even being told that though. I mean, like how would they know that more murders are happening while they're in jail? Well, the community was getting more and more pissed off because mm -hmm. they're still dying. And mm -hmm. so like, Right. I think they knew, and Raymond actually was released. Okay. They were like, clearly this isn't you. And I think they, they offered- they kept the, her? Well, they, I think they offered the same to Clementine. However, Clementine, even though she was behind bars during the Broussard family murders, she confessed to having a hand in the killings from afar and that she was responsible for more, for more murders than the public even knew about. She claimed involvement in the murder of some 35 murders or 35 people between 1911 and 1912 and that she worked with several accomplices who were part of the voodoo cult, though she could never identify any of these alleged accomplices. So this is just I think it's a bullshit. fucking coerced mm -hmm. confession. Ugh. Poor, oh, Quote, poor after poor her girl. confession, Clementine was examined by several doctors, read several white doctors, most mm -hmm. of whom deduced that she was perfectly sane and therefore telling the truth and able to maintain her sentence. Yeah, perfectly sane people do false confessions all the time, especially mm -hmm. when all the cards are stacked against them. Right. Via she is a 17-year-old girl. Gender, yeah. privilege, She's a girl. education. Mm -hmm. She's a kid. She's a oh my God! This is due so to horrible. the severity of her crimes, Clementine was sent to the infamous Angola State Penitentiary near the Louisiana State Capital of Red Stick, Baton Rouge. Angola, that prison is supposed to be—it's bad, the worst prison in the yeah. country. So Clementine's confession also seemed to bolster what the newspapers had been saying about the murderer's ritualistic tendencies. She claimed to be part of a secret cult called the Church of Sacrifice. Quote, this cult and its secretive human five gang were supposedly part of the Christ sanctified holy church, an evangelical church headed by a man named King Harrison. The church could be found all along the Southern Pacific Railroad. And according to Clementine's confession, Harrison encouraged his congregation to use lethal discipline against any wayward members. Clementine also told Louisiana authorities that she was a voodoo sorceress who enjoyed supernatural protection from her punishment, end quote. You can just see where and what words and evidence they fed to her mm -hmm. to get her to say these things. What, mm -hmm. what, what made you do the human sacrifice? What mm -hmm. church made... The, ch the church of sacrifice. Mm -hmm. yeah. Why did you write human five? What gang are you with? Oh, we're the Human Five gang. Yeah. And you may be shocked to find out that there was no evidence whatsoever to back up these claims of this church existing, of this King Harrison person existing, any of it. Any of it. But the cops had someone behind bars, so she remained in jail for crimes that it is entirely unlikely she committed, based on confessions she made that were likely coerced, influenced by the media around her, and the fact that, like, her stories kept changing with the original being that her father was the murderer. Like she implicated her father at first paired with clearly or likely some undiagnosed mental health issues from trauma that she's experiencing. Yeah. All wrapped up in a neat little bow of racism to just keep everything in a tight little package. Yeah, so she stayed in fear. prison. She's yeah. also fucking 17. She's a kid. Yeah. So, quote, in 1942, when the Federal Writers Project wrote down the history of Clementine's trial, they noted that confusion was the one constant in the case. It's like some Brendan Dassey shit. Yeah. In fact, given that newspapers had already suggested that a voodoo cult was behind the murders, Clementine could have been influenced by such coverage and cooked up the Church of Sacrifice as part of her confession of or been, like, led down that path. Yeah. Tragically, after Clementine's story circulated around the Southeast, many white citizens began to suspect their black neighbors belonged to the murderous sacrifice church. This belief led to a handful of violent encounters and false arrests, end quote. Yeah, be afraid of the people that you enslaved. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And who are now being Ugh. murdered in their homes. Yeah. 
So Clementine ended up being the only quote-unquote suspect to serve any time for these murders that she most likely had nothing to do with at all. And to further solidify to the community that she was responsible, the Lafayette advisor printed her full confession in the paper on April 5th, 1912, but added at the end, quote, Clementine's confession has been received with varying shades of belief owing to the positive way she swore in the trial of her father and the misleading information she has given as to her accomplices. But yeah, we're just going to print this keep, whole thing. She can't keep her confession straight because they're just it's feeding not her different true. shit. Yeah, exactly. She made a failed attempt at escape in 1913, but this was pretty quickly, like, forgiven. Like, they were just like, okay, I feel like get they back used here. to not give a shit about escape attempts. They were just yeah. like, fair enough. Yeah. This is shitty. Yeah. Exactly. And in, 19, in 1918, she began work, which I say in quotes, i.e. prison enslavement, yeah. as a cane cutter, which meant she spent time outside of the walls of the prison under pretty minimal supervision, but she did not make any other attempts to escape. She was released in August of 1923 for good behavior after serving 12 years, and there wasn't a trace of her in the news or the history books after that. We don't know when or where she died, how old she was. Mm -hmm. She just, poof, was like, fuck this, I'm out. Yeah, yeah, I don't want to be known for this. Right, I'm hoping. I never did. Exactly. I'm hoping she just, like, went to live a a quiet life somewhere. Yeah, Yeah. got married maybe, changed her name. Yeah, that's, you know, that's what I hope for her. With historians largely believing that Clementine was innocent, many theorize that the true culprit was Paul Mueller. Here we go. A, a German immigrant who may, who many believe to be the deadliest serial killer in American history, though we may never know because his kill count cannot be confirmed. His MO was to ride the railways across the U.S. and Canada, murdering along the way with axes he found in people's homes. He remains a suspect in one of Lucy's favorite mysteries, the Velisca Axe Murders. Mm. Hmm. The most like honestly, train, baby. Yeah. yeah, that's like the most likely thing. But it's wow. also one of those things too, where it's like the man, the the man on the train kind of reminds me of Israel Keys in the sense that like true crime enthusiasts will attribute a lot every like every time there's an unsolved axe murder in history, it's like wow, it was probably Paul Mueller. You know well, what I mean? And also, there is one kind of fits though. It totally it, fits. I think it was. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But also... I'm one of those enthusiasts. <laughs> it's impossible to know how many serial killers that we are not aware of. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So of course, it could be two different people because honestly... Yeah. It's not that original of an idea to ride the trains around the country and no, kill it's not. people in their own but homes. But killing entire families for no reason, like not stealing anything and then posing bodies and then draining bodies of blood, like that yeah, is that's some... pretty this, MO this person specific. I mean, this was outrageous. The posing, the psalm, the right mm-hmm. the draining of the blood. But there yeah. was creepy shit. In the Velisca house too, didn't they like not cover like the that. mirrors and yeah? But that's I. It's not that's the same. Different, yeah. It's not the same. But there could have been some, like you said, if it was multiple people, or elements of drama, escalation. Yeah, trying different mm-hmm. things, and then influences by the region that you're in. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So if you're some white murderer terrorizing a black neighborhood mm-hmm. in Louisiana, where like white folks are already stereotyping, you know. Well, yeah, you choose more. Like it's West like African serial rit- killers ritual. Yeah. Go after, you know, s- street sex workers and survival mm-hmm. sex workers because they're the most marginalized people and it's easiest to get away with it. Right. So, I mean, I, I'm not going to rule out that it was the same guy or someone from that sort of like network of people It definitely wasn't fucking Clementine. It wasn't. It wasn't that's Clementine. all that matters was it was not her. <laughs> it was not fucking Clementine. Not even close. I was also close. thinking, like you said, you know, they, they suspected that the murderer was black because they occurred in black neighborhoods where mm-hmm. white people would night. stick out. Exactly. It was at night. It's also not... It's not that hard to conceal your whiteness if that is your intention. It's not. And also, what are these black families going to do? At, call the ask the police to come help them yeah, like no. right. what are they gonna what are they honestly what what are they expected to do if a white individual comes into into what right there's like there's nowhere that black people are safe there certainly right. was not at that right. time there still isn't now 
So like that that was the theory among police, but that's I think a they meant pretty because weak there theory. weren't witnesses coming forward and saying I saw a white guy, but also right. like it would be pretty tough to come forward and say that even nowadays. Mm-hmm. 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 So yeah, I mean, again, it's just like it was so sad to read this and go, oh yeah, nothing's changed. Like we're still doing this in our justice system after more than a hundred years yeah to marginalize 110 years individuals later yeah. like it's fucked so anyway clementine you didn't do it you didn't and we do know it. you didn't do it you, i'm sorry you served 12 years that fucking sucks i hope you went mm-hmm. on and had a fabulous life yes after that. that is my prayer and that's my case all right well Can we be done now fucking <laughs> louisiana is off the rails. Off the rails. Yeah. But well, interesting. Thanks, Taylor. It was a fascinating <laughs> episode. I still want to go back to New Orleans. Yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, right. yeah. Yes, yes. And maybe Baton Rouge. I don't know. Never been. Good I've old never seen a red, red stick, stick in my life. <laughs> yeah. I'm ready. Okay. Thank you, Taylor. We love you. Yep. See you next week. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to Wine and Crime. Our cover art is by Kala Yip. Music by Phil Young and Corey Wendell. Editing by Jonathan Camp. Check out our website and blog at wineandcrimepodcast.com. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at wineandcrimepod. If you have questions, answers, or recommendations to share, email us at wineandcrimepodcast at gmail.com. Episodes are available on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, basically wherever you get your favorite podcasts. And if you like the show, please rate, review, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts. It is the best way to spread the word. If you'd like to show your support and get a shout out on air, visit our Patreon page to keep this podcast and the wine flowing. Cheers!